Hello and welcome to Inside the Vault. My name is Sandy Trenholm and I'm the Collection Director for the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History. And tonight we'll be discussing Thomas Paine's pamphlet, Common Sense, with Professor Eric Slaughter. And with that, I want to introduce Professor Eric Slaughter from the University of Chicago. Um, we're very excited to be working with you, not only tonight, but you're teaching one of our MA courses in the fall. So Eric, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, and I'm very excited about that. So yeah, as you said, Sandy, I'm a professor at the University of Chicago. I teach courses in early American history, early American literature, early American political thought. I wrote a book about the origins of the Constitution, and I'm trying um, to write a new book about the uh, origins, meanings, and afterlives of the Declaration of Independence. So I'm especially excited um, to be coming to New York in a few weeks to film some um, some lectures on uh, the Declaration um, and to be able to use some of the materials. Uh, there will be a lecture on common sense. I think it's lecture three on popular politics. Common sense played a uh, a very big role in the movement for independence. And some even think that um, secretly Thomas Paine uh, was the author of the of the declaration, but that's not something we'll um, necessarily get into <laughs> get into tonight. But um, yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thanks so much. Great. And this is a great lead in too, to the, um, is it the semi-centennial, oof, I tripped over that word, the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. So- Exactly, exactly. And the 250th anniversary of Common Sense. Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that. That's great. All right. And with that, let's get started. Eric, so what should we know about Thomas Paine? Um, well, you should know, uh, it looks like from the slide um, that he arrived in Philadelphia uh, with a letter of introduction from Benjamin Franklin in 1774. I believe he was... Um, carried, uh, he, he was sick during the voyage and carried off the, the ship on a stretcher. Um, it was a few weeks before he uh, recovered and was able to present his, uh, his letter of introduction to um, one of Franklin's relatives uh, who connected him with uh, Robert Aiken, who was a, um, a printer and bookseller who himself had just recently, within the last five or so years, emigrated from uh, from Scotland, uh, Robert Aiken is perhaps best known um, as the first printer uh, in the United States to print the New Testament. Many people have heard of the Aiken Bible. It was uh, it was not lawful to to print uh, the Bible in English in the colonies, although it had been printed in Massachusetts language, the Mohawk language, and the German language well before. Um, Aiken did it in 1777, but but Aiken was um, starting up a magazine called the Pennsylvania Magazine, and though uh, Paine had never done sort of similar work, he had um, he had taught school and he had written a pamphlet when he had been an excise officer, uh, and seemed to to know what he was um, what he was doing. Uh, the the story um, of the making of common sense. Uh, has to do with his gravitating to a, a circle of, of men, um, uh, including Benjamin Rush, who was a physician who had trained in, in, um, in the UK in Edinburgh, uh, as well as um, David Rittenhouse, a man of science, but also John Adams and Timothy Matlack. Um, some of your viewers may know Timothy Matlack as the uh, as the clerk who physically engrossed the Declaration of Independence um, uh, when he was a clerk for the Pennsylvania uh, um, then State Assembly uh, in, in 1776. But um, the story is, and it was Benjamin Rush who um, most often told this story, and so Rush plays a, a huge role in it, um, that uh, that uh, Rush suggested that Payne write something to support independence, but that um, because the word independence was so offensive to so many people that he tried to avoid that word um, and just present a, a kind of um, case for, for separation, political separation, but avoiding the, the dangerous word. In the end, I think Payne um, Payne used it, uh, but, no, but but actually pretty infrequently, something like six or eight times uh, in the pamphlet compared to the um, the other word that was circulating at the time, which was reconciliation, which was used something like like fourteen or fifteen times in the 
in the pamphlet. Uh, the pamphlet, um, as a lot of people know, caught fire. It was one of the, the um, great uh, successes in the pamphlet um, literature of the American Revolution, uh, becoming printed ultimately in, I think, 10 different locations. Um, and, you know, uh, Payne died um, in 1809, uh, having produced two more really um, very important books, monumental uh, books, um, one called The Rights of Man and the other one called The Age of Reason. These um, books, uh, particularly The Rights of Man, gained him a widespread audience, transatlantic audience. The Age of Reason tended to foreclose um, some of that success so that when he died, it was um, hard to find mourners. Uh, it was also um, hard to generate uh, interest in producing the same kind of um, attention to Paine and his life that had been devoted to, say, George Washington or later to, uh, to John Adams and, and, and Benjamin Franklin and, and uh, Thomas Jefferson. And even now, we don't have a major, um, a major uh, enterprise at a university press the way we have big, um, big scale uh, editorial, documentary editorial treatments for those uh, those very famous um, those very famous figures. Thank you. Um, so this is our version of Common Sense, which is a little bit different from the one that was published in 1776. So, do you want to start off by talking about the different printings of Common Sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is a real um, this is a real gem. Uh, this is a, a copy. Uh, from the early 1790s, really uh, a moment when Paine's um, reputation uh, for having written uh, the rights of man uh, and defending the, the French Revolution, often along the lines of the American Revolution, he really saw the, the French Revolution as a, a moment when the new world could regenerate the old. Um, and so it brought common sense back into publication. No one had thought to, I think, reprint common sense between 1776 and 1791, um, in part because it was a topical pamphlet. It raises the question, you know, why would you want to read uh, a, the case for, um, for a political separation with Britain after that political separation had been um, affected, after a war had been fought and, and so forth. Um, very few of the pamphlets from the American Revolution were ever then reprinted um, uh, you know, um, in, the, in the period. But this was a book that you know, has a really fascinating publication history. It was published in January of, of 1776 on the very same day that um, that uh, newspapers began to report in Philadelphia a speech given by King George III from October uh, of 1775, in which the king, um, you know, essentially declared the colonists out of his royal protection and encouraged Parliament um, uh, to even strengthen the, the coercive measures that had been taken in 1774 um, against these uh, this rebellious population that he said was um, was uh, designing towards an independent empire. And, you know, the story of the publication has all sorts of twists and turns where um, Payne fought with his original publisher in in uh, in January and February and then brought the, the book over to another publisher um, in, in mid-February with some additions that answered criticisms of common sense um, and made the book uh, more valuable. It also brought the cost down. It was always Payne's um, hope that this would be uh, a cheaper pamphlet that could reach more people. Um, he had created a scheme with his original publisher that um, they would split the profits, but his part of the profits would go um, to defraying costs for the Continental Army. I think in particular, that uh, um, was earmarked for mittens for Continental um, soldiers. Uh, a kind of war erupted in the newspapers between Payne and his publisher, Payne, you know, for, from an anonymous standpoint. But ultimately, the book was then republished, not just in Philadelphia, where it was translated into German for the large German-speaking population, but also in various centers 
all around the the north various municipalities including you know boston and salem and newburyport and providence and um and newport uh several places in uh in in connecticut it was not however reprinted i think south of philadelphia um that we know uh it, it had uh, an impact and we even know that there are members uh, um uh readers from from the south who responded um to it in both positive and and negative ways um but it was you know it was an incredible uh success the circulation numbers that are often cited um come from thomas paine himself and have been um uh subjected to a lot of scrutiny um by uh by scholars um uh who like Trish Lofgren of the University of Illinois point to the fact that that the print infrastructure of the time could not probably have supported that number um, of uh, of imprints. Um, although you know each copy would have probably circulated to a number of of different readers, it might have been read aloud. Um, and we know that you know members of uh, of the military were reading this pamphlet. Um, years after uh, the the um, during the war, but years after independence, in part to sort of restoke their their interest. Um, so it was it was definitely uh, a, a pamphlet that circulated far more than any other pamphlet had. It ultimately was reprinted in London in several editions, in Edinburgh and Stirling and Newcastle. There were French translations made in uh, Rotterdam. Uh, there was a, another German translation, a second German translation that was um, published uh, in uh, 1777. And of course, there were replies in newspapers and pamphlets, but not um, not as many as you would think for a pamphlet that circulated so so widely. Just to give you a, a sense, maybe five separate pamphlets responded to to common sense across the Atlantic, including a few in, in Philadelphia and, and um, a few that were written by Americans, but published in, in Great Britain, one, I think, in Dublin, one in, um, in, uh, in Edinburgh. But compared to um, something like Richard Price's pamphlet, Observations on the Nature of Civil Liberty, which was published in February of 1776, so the month that Payne brought out a larger enlarged edition, the one that most people tend to read, uh, what's called the third edition of Common Sense, which was published on February 14, 1776. Price's pamphlet um, was responded to by 32 separate pamphlets. So it did not reach perhaps as many readers, um, but uh, the controversial literature around it was far greater um, than than uh than common sense and in fact you know when the declaration was published in philadelphia in a newspaper on i think july 7th or 8th uh um an ad for richard price's observations of, on the nature of civil liberty appeared um, because it had just been printed it just reached uh philadelphia and thus became perhaps the first um book to be printed in the new united states now, Allison has a question, but I'm going to ask one first. Why do you think there were so few rebuttals to it? Well, it, you can see in the rebuttals the frustration that um, <laughs> that his his uh, adv that his uh, adversaries had. Um, Payne's pamphlet doesn't look like a lot of um, the pamphlets that you find in the pre-revolutionary -re period. So, if you were to think about the most popular pamphlet from before this period, this moment um, by John Dickinson, who was a political moderate and, and an attorney and so forth. Um, he produced a, a series called Letters from a Farmer in Pennsylvania uh, against um, uh, various duties and acts in the late 1760s passed by Parliament. These when they were bound together as a pamphlet, looked like a modern law review article or like a modern Supreme Court uh, opinion. They just have um, just a surplus, um, uh, extravagant surplus of footnotes, you know, see lock on government, see Hume and so forth. And Payne didn't operate that way. Um, he made very few appeals to authority. He said he was, you know, relying on uh, doctrines of, of nature and feeling and reason and, 
you know, call it common sense, um, but that he was not appealing to authorities. He was also not um, engaged in the imperial debate in the way others had been. So he wasn't he wasn't interested in um, whether this or that act was constitutional or not. What he wanted to say was that the entire British constitution itself was rotten and it was rotten um, to the core because of the monarchy. Uh, and so um, this was a, th there, there was a lot of bombast in the, in the essay and there were all kinds of arguments. Um, it would be very hard. Each of his, uh, each, of, each of those who tried to uh, refute common sense found it very difficult to, um, to touch all the bases that that Payne had touched. So if you like uh, contract thought, there's a there's a small section at the beginning about contract theory. If you um, are a reader of the Bible, there's a long section in the second part uh, that proves that um, monarch that there were anti-monarchical passages in the Old Testament and that the the old concept of monarchy might be a a, a sin. In the third part, there were various arguments, um, uh, some of them about um, the, the way in which uh, the nature of the connection between um, America and Britain um, was not helpful to, uh, to America. And then finally, there were uh, you know, um, charts about the cost of building ships and uh, kind of practicalities uh, of how you might form a, a government. You know, a pamphlet that is not a direct refutation of um, common sense was written by, but but is um, getting close there. There uh, was by John Adams, who I think some of his friends thought he had written common sense, and for a while I think he was maybe flattered by that. But he came to feel that Paine was, um, as he put it, better at building up than uh, or uh, tearing down than building up. Uh, he was a not a great political architect, and that the. Um, short sketch of what a government, uh, continental government and a continental charter might look like in common sense was just not very practical. For instance, Payne imagined, you know, a continental Congress with 390 members instead of the 50 or so members that were currently in Congress in order to, to promote a greater, greater representation. Um, in any case, uh, there was a, again, just a, a sense that it was very hard um, that anyone who wanted to refute common sense uh, um, faced a kind of uphill battle because there was just there were just so many arguments in so many directions. I think you know uh, also you reached a, they the colonies had reached a certain point um, uh, where with the military phase with the sense that the king had put um, put the colonists out of their out of his protection and so forth that. Uh, more were beginning to feel that um, independence was at least a, a possibility if they didn't think it was a reasonable or a commonsensical thing. So, Allison, what is our question, please? I kind of have a, a grouping of questions because people are asking a lot of really, really interesting questions about sort of the, the physical book itself or the pamphlet itself and the sale uh, of it and how payments work. So, um, Chad wants to know uh, how payments worked back then publications, you know, who received the bulk of the funds. There was a question about how big uh, the actual document is and what the pages are made of. Um, and who was this written for? Was it written for the common person or was it written for someone who is a little bit more, you know, maybe higher in society? Yeah, those are all wonderful questions. So, you know, when, um, when common sense first came out, I think the one of the slogans was um, "common sense for eighteen pence uh, for eighteen you know eighteen pennies." Um, this particular edition, the one that's uh, sitting in the vault at the Gilder Lehrman um, Institute or Gilder Lehrman Collection, uh, is priced as you can see at six pence, so a third the price of the um, of the original edition. Payne, as I said, wanted to wanted to bring the cost down, and for this particular copy, um, this was called the pocket edition of Common Sense, and it was uh, it was part of a um, a group of texts by Payne, including the Rights of Man, um, Part One, Part Two. Uh, the book that is effectively The Rights of Man, part three, called A Letter Addressed to the Addressers, A Letter to Abby Renal, a number of other, um, another, uh, other works all bound together. And in fact, the copy at the Gilder Lehrman has 
many um, different pamphlets and includes not only the rights of man, and, uh, but it includes the age of reason, which was often not um, grouped together with Paine's um, political writings. In the 19th century, they would say those were his um, theological writings and they were so often um, segregated out from, from the, uh, the political works. Um, but you know, this was designed to, um, to reach uh, the widest audience possible. And we don't know all that much about the economics of printing political pamphlets. In some cases, um, authors paid for their own uh, publication and then distributed them because they wanted to get out their, their message. In other cases, um, an author might, um, as, as was the case with Payne, uh, agree to share the profits, uh, might put up half uh, to begin with. Um, there was a risk in publishing common sense, a reputational risk um, to the to the first um, printer, Robert Bell, but he took it. Um, and you know, other other printers were were willing to um, to take the risk too. There was a definite risk in the 1790s to publishing pain, um, especially after the second part of Rights of Man. Um, was declared to be a seditious libel, and Payne was um, prosecuted uh, and tried in absentia for the rights of man. Then um, this became a, a you know a, a commodity that was um, in which the the publishers themselves could be could be held liable for um, seditious libel if the author wasn't. So um, it took it took some. Um, some in, some guts uh, to to be one of Payne's uh, publishers, especially of the some of the later the later writings. Um, but uh, I hope that that begins to to sort of answer it. And in terms of the the question of who this is meant for, I do think it's meant for a much wider reader readership than um, than some of those earlier political pamphlets. James Otis's Rights of the British uh, Colonies Asserted and Proved from the 1760s, or John Dickinson's. Um, those were really, you know, uh, in, in many cases, um, though they tried to appeal to a, to a wider readership beyond uh, elites, were written in a way that, um, you know, you would need to know maybe uh, the basic argument of lock on government, or you might need to know um, the, the relevant precedents that, um, that were being cited. There was very little pain told you that you needed to know, except, you know, um, just to put your prejudices away. Um, so as I was saying before, the pamphlet doesn't look like other pamphlets. It doesn't have running footnotes. It, it's it's not making those kind of appeals. And, uh, you know, a lot of the language um, is very direct. Some of it is very crude. Um, this is something that John Adams later commented on, that some parts seem like they might be written by a new great, a Newgate immigrant, by which he meant somebody who was um, sentenced to uh, uh, to be um, uh, uh, expelled from from Britain uh, and sent over to the colonies as a convict, let's say. Um, so you know it had it had the a, a kind of lower class, uh, um, almost criminal language. But I think you know in part that was that was one of the things that was electrifying to readers. Just. Um, probably caused them a, a moment of scandal, but they had never seen um, figures in the British government or, or especially the king referred to in um, the kind of coarse way in which, um, which Payne did. Uh, and for as a practical uh, example here, it's 19 centimeters tall. And when it's closed, it's 12 centimeters wide. So uh, we do measure in centimeters because it's better for how we house the materials to make sure they all fit in the right cases. But that is not big at all, 19 by 12. So it's, it's yeah. very small. Um, they had larger pockets, I think, than we do. But, but it, it was, you know, I, I think it was imagined as a, a cheaper edition. Um, the the copy of Common Sense itself is about 30 or so pages. It's not very long compared to some of the printings in 1776, where you might have 60 or, or even 75 or, or so pages. Um, and the type is really tightly printed. I mean, it, um, it, you know, if you were familiar with different printed objects in the 18th century, this would look cheap to you. Um, you know, this was not a deluxe addition, uh, uh, um, nor did Payne want it to be. 
So with that, you asked us to start with the Boston Massacre. Can you talk about that? Well, I, I think it's so wonderful. I mean, the, the Gilder Lehrman is, um, is fortunate to have such a, such a wonderful um, copy of this very famous engraving, um, all of which were, of course, hand colored. And this is the famous scene that um, Payne depict, that uh, Paul Revere depicted just a few weeks after the, the, um, the incident, um, referring to it as the bloody massacre um and you know situating the the british soldiers under uh butcher's hall um and uh to show that in, innocent uh you know innocent americans were um suffering as a result of uh administration british administration um policies and the garrisoning of troops in in boston and so forth and just the amount of gore here i think is so wonderful it's all um, as I was saying, hand painted, so you see uh, the blood of um, of uh, the sufferers, as both Revere and and Payne might have said. I do believe Crispus Attucks is um, is uh, depicted a uh, black American who who um, died uh, at this at this event. Um, but you know, I think one way to think about um, common sense is as a kind of verbal equivalent um, in some ways of, of this, uh, this visual propaganda. Payne was sitting in Philadelphia. He'd landed in Philadelphia. That's where Congress was also sitting and where they were making decisions about independence. The legislature in Philadelphia, the Pennsylvania Colonial Assembly, before it was the State Assembly, Provincial Assembly, had given instructions to its delegates not to vote for independence if it if it came up. Um, they had a group of moderates in their in their congressional delegation, including John Dickinson, um, who were not uh, in favor of um, political independence in, from Great Britain without exhausting all the measures that could be made for reconciliation. And what Payne did was to say, you know, if you're sitting in in um, Philadelphia, you don't know. You need to transport your imaginations to Boston. And he's thinking about Boston, not in 1770, but Boston in um, early 1776, nine months after um, the what he refers to as a massacre at, uh, at Lexington, um, the, the beginning of the military phase of the American War for Independence. And, you know, he says things like, you know, if you favor reconciliation over independence, you need to ask yourself a series of questions like, has your house been burnt? You know, how, has your family suffered? Um, because if you haven't, then you have no ability to judge those who have. Um, uh, but what Payne said is he was going to make the, the condition of the sufferers his own, his own cause. Um, and, you know, the pamphlet, um, as I said before, is, is highly eclectic, but it has lots of language of um, feeling and sentiment um, designed to, um, to provoke people into uh, identification um, with the city that was at the you know, center of, whether you call them the intolerable acts or the coercive measures or, or what have you of 1774, the acts that, Parliament passed in the wake of the destruction of the tea in Boston Harbor. Um, Boston was at the center of this, and um, and so uh, and so Payne is, you know, um, throughout the pamphlet, just you know, reflecting that those, you know, those only can judge of of this um, who have a real visceral sense of the destruction of people and property. And the next item you wanted us to talk about was the Boston Gazette. So what's going on here? Yeah, I uh, this is, my, I think, my favorite newspaper from from the period. Um, it was the most radical newspaper. Uh, it printed all sorts of um, articles by John Adams in the 1760s, the pieces that became known as the dissertation on canon and feudal law uh, against the Stamp Act. Um, but also just occasional writings that he published under the byline um, Humphrey Plowjob or just an ordinary uh, uh, farmer and, and so forth. Uh, it was printed by uh, Benjamin Eads and John Gill in Boston. They were 
about as radical, I think, as, as printers could be at the period. Um, you know, after one controversy in early 1773, they decided they would print a cheap edition of John Locke's second treatise because you might have read it if you had gone to Harvard, but almost nobody had. And so um, they made a, a very cheap version um, of the second treatise available because people were beginning to talk about Locke and, you know, um, how would you know if uh, if uh, if a government had gone too far in the in the direction of um, infringements on rights and so forth? And then they brought out ads in their newspapers and others saying, you know, everybody should buy this, you know, uh, men and women should read it, um, children should be taught it uh, and so forth. And, um, you know, this is a great example of sort of, you know, um, putting common sense back into context, the reading of common sense. So this particular issue has got, um, uh, you can see it there just below the masthead, um, a message from Congress, a, a resolution that that um, is their new privateering laws where they're fitting out uh, privateering vessels, essentially the, the beginnings of a, of a kind of American Navy or chartering an American Navy. The paper is printed not in Boston, but in Watertown because Boston is occupied at that moment. And there's a letter inside from um, George Washington to the town of Boston trying to offer some reassurances and protections that might be coming from the Continental Army. Um, but it also, as, as the next slide shows, has a, an ad for um, common sense. Uh, and so, you know, one of the viewers was asking about the, the sort of market of this. And I think it is important to think about the you know, the the marketing of revolution, the marketplace for pamphlets like this. Um, this was, uh, you know, um, John Gill, who was one of the, the publishers and Benjamin Eads and some of the some of the other publishers in Boston getting together and um, agreeing to publish a new edition of Common Sense. So this is in April. It's basically the the February edition that appeared in in um, Philadelphia, what we call the third edition. But you can see that they're, um, they crucially advertise that it comes with several editions in the body of the work to which is added an appendix and an address to the representatives of the people called Quakers. Payne, whose father was a Quaker, wrote um, a short uh, a diatribe uh, directed towards some of the, the uh, Quakers in um, Philadelphia and Pennsylvania who had, um, he felt, uh, wrongly mingled religion and politics, even though that was something he did with some um, some fervor within the pages of, uh, of Common Sense, especially in the second, second part. But you'll notice it says, note bene, this edition contains upwards of one third more than any former one. So even if you've already bought and read a copy of Common Sense, you might wanna get this one because it includes these new, these new editions, um, and this was this was true. I mean, I, you know, uh, I've seen copies of Common Sense that include things like large editions that are not by Payne, uh, part of, uh, texts like um, one called the American Patriots Prayer that appeared uh, in a in a copy I think uh, maybe printed in Newburyport in a in a text called Lar Large Editions to Common Sense. So there was a whole. Um, it's called a penumbra around common sense uh, of additional supporting materials. And this was, you know, uh, you, you know, if you've heard that there are various editions of common sense, you can rest assured that if you purchase this one, you will get the full thing, you know, more, more than, um, than the original. So I, yeah, I, I love, I love seeing things like this. I just love seeing ads in the paper too, and how they discuss things. But this next one is one of the other uh, versions of Common Sense in 1792. So can you tell us about this? Yeah, so this one is almost I identical to um, to the one in the Gilder Lehrman collection. Uh, again, you can sort of see from the thickness that it's not just the pamphlet Common Sense. It's also the rights of man, parts one, parts two, the the letter to the um, address to the addressers and some some other text to bulk it out. But this was one of those pocket editions um, brought out mostly by the same uh, publisher, H.D. Simons. This one in 1792, um, when Payne had become, you know, a, a far bigger, um, had a far bigger uh, readership in part from his controversy with um, Edmund Burke, who had written uh, Reflections on the Revolution in France in 1790. 
Paine had replied in early 1791 with the rights of man dedicated to George Washington and to the idea of the sort of regeneration of the, of the old world by, by the new. Um, and then part two had come out and the prosecution um, had, had begun. So um, this was a, a, an attempt to bring the, bring the book out um, to, to a wider readership. Um, through these six penny pocket editions. And, you know, it was in 1791, 1792 that the first editions of Common Sense since the American Revolution began to be published. And, you know, one of the reasons um, was not just the notoriety of the French Revolution, but because there was such an excessive quality to Common Sense. In other words, it went beyond simply an argument about the preparedness of of the United uh, of what would become the United States to um, engage in a war to or to um, effectively trade with other nations if its um, status as a dependent um, set of colonies was uh, abandoned. It also included direct attacks on just the idea of monarchy itself, um, along with proposals for how a kind of more equitable rep representation might be um, might be managed, and those you know poured over into the pages of the Rights of Man, um, which includes all sorts of economic arguments, um, really the um, arguments that sort of lay the groundwork for a kind of um, almost welfare uh, state. Um, but in, but in any case, you know, Payne's notoriety had come back uh, and and had brought this pamphlet. Um, back into currency, um, and not just as a nostalgia piece, not just, you know, oh, do you remember how quaint it was, you know, 15 years ago, um, this, these arguments about the American Revolution, but really as a, a kind of radical text that might promote um, among a readership in Britain uh, reforms to Parliament, reforms to the British Constitution. Again, Paine thought the British Constitution, at least in in common sense, was a, a rotten constitution. You know, in the rights of man, he says, actually, Britain has no constitution at all, because the meaning of the word had had fundamentally shifted in those um, fifteen or so years. So no longer was it simply the arrangement of you know the various four parts of the government. It was a written document. So Paine said, you know, if you can't pull it out of your pocket uh, and and refer to it. Um, then you don't have one. You know, this was his answer to Burke and and to the to the idea of the sort of evolving um, British Constitution. Uh, Paine would have none of it, and so yes, you know, this was a book that suddenly became relevant again. We see editions, you know, in Albany in 1791 in New York, um, the first American edition since uh, since the Revolution. We see editions in Paris in 1792, um, where Paine has been. Uh, granted French citizenship and even elected now into the um, French National Convention, uh, um, where he will sit uh, during the um, the various um, as they debate what they should do uh, with um, King Louis the Sixteenth. Uh, Payne makes a kind of impassioned argument, saying that. Um, you know, given given um, his support for a, a revolution in America, um, though he supported it not in his legal capacity, that maybe he could be banished to the United States, stripped of his title and banished to the, the United States rather than um, executed. And, you know, Payne was tried in absentia in December of 1792 and found guilty and made an outlaw. Um, he could not return to uh, Great Britain. Um, by December of 1793, he was effectively an outlaw. His his um, wing of the French Revolution um, uh, had run up against the Jacobins, and he was himself imprisoned. Um, and it was in that prison, uh, I think, in Luxembourg Palace, that he that he um, you know finished the the age of of uh, of reason. Um, so suddenly, Payne was back in the in the news, um, and common sense uh, was was along for the ride. So can we take a look at some of the different uh, texts that you've featured for us tonight? Yeah. Um, so one of the incredible things about the copy at um, the Gilder Lehrman uh, collection uh, is that like all 18th century British printings of common sense, um, the printers and publishers who reprinted were subject to seditious libel um, 
Uh, and so we're careful um, to avoid naming names. Uh, so, you know, when it says <laughs> Lord North, they get rid of the name. Um, when it mentions uh, the king, uh, they get rid of the name. Um, and uh, so what readers would have encountered in, in the copy um, in 1793, printed, you know, printed in 1793, is a, is a text that's full of um, what the printers called hiatuses. So more than just uh, spaces for, you know, for one, one name, just whole phrases that are um, excised so that the publishers are not subject um, to seditious libel prosecution, uh, paying fines, spending time in prison, as was the case um, with the prosecution of, of the rights of man and, and various printers who had been involved. Uh, in that. So um, this is a good game, though. Can you guess what goes into the into the um, the space there? This is one of the most famous passages, you know, oh, ye that love mankind, yet dare that dare oppose not only the tyranny, but blank stand forth. Every spot of this old world is overrun with oppression. Freedom hath been hunted round the globe. Asia and Africa have long expelled her. Europe regards her like a stranger and England hath given her warning to depart. Oh, receive the fugitive and prepare in time an asylum for mankind. It's a vision of the sort of universal um, cause and importance of the of of the American Revolution. No longer is this just a dispute about um, taxation or representation, right? The entire um, the entire planet is involved um, because uh, because what is at risk is one of the last remaining sites for freedom in the world, right? Um, so you can see uh, what an incredible um, passage this is. But yeah. If you want to show us what goes in the in the middle, yes. Oh, ye that love mankind, ye that dare oppose not only the tyranny, but the tyrant stand forth. So this was taken to be a direct attack on George III, the tyrant of England, and consequently printers would not touch it. Um, but this particular uh, copy was owned by a young man named Ezra Morell, who in the early uh, 19th century or 1809 or so um, is the date written in the book, filled it out. Um, uh, he may have had a friend. He lived, he lived in, um, in, uh, in America, in the United States, and he may have had a friend who had an older copy that uh, had been printed in the U.S. Uh, or printed in late colonial British America that had all the words. Um, or there might have been another way, and I'll show you that in a, in a minute, in which he could have filled it out. But it is it is rather extraordinary um, to find a copy that has been uh, annotated, um, where the blanks have been uh, filled in. And this page just gives you a sense. So um, the the top the top left gives you um, the passage, the same passage as it appeared in uh, Robert Bell's um, edition of Common Sense in 1776. That was the January 1776, the first edition. There were some editions like the third edition that was published by um, the Bradford brothers in, in Philadelphia where they were a little bit more careful and they, uh, they deleted passages, not as many as the, the British did, but they, they, they added, you know, they, they took out some, some things, but it, um, when it was printed in, in Britain um, by a bookseller named John uh, Allman, who, who published almost all of the controversial literature of America uh, in this period. And um, when it came time for him to reprint Common Sense, he felt he could not um, include these phrases. And so added those, um, those hiatuses in the 1776 editions um, and most editions you know, that followed that that edition in, in Britain um, did the same. Allison has a question. Yes, so I wanna point out, there are a lot of questions in the Q&A. We're not gonna be able to get to all of them, but we really appreciate everybody participating and um, sharing your thoughts with us. Um, a question that I would like for, uh, for one of you to answer in a minute is, can you explain uh, the, the long S? Um, but before you do that, there's a question from Ellie and Ellie wants to know how many of the suggestions that were in common sense were actually used and or debated for the government and other areas of the community and the economy? Yeah, those are both great questions. I'll take the second one first. Um, you know, paint, 
Payne um, thought he was being practical. John Adams didn't think so, but Payne thought he was being practical. And so there were um, you know, statistics about the cost of shipbuilding. Um, there was a sketch which he described as preliminary about how you might um, produce a uh, continental charter and what the representational structure should be. He had a whole um, theory about what a majority should be. He basically felt that you know, um, to pass any public measures, it should be passed with 60% uh, of the vote in Congress. Um, so basically what we would um, think of as, you know, the, fil the filibuster uh, threshold now, um, but that, you know, that was a way of, of sort of signaling um, a cl closer to unanimity. There was such a great privilege for, for unanimity um, in the period. Um, so I think, you know, uh, of the practical suggestions, some of them um, were certainly followed. Payne said things like, you know, in order to have a, a legal charter, it can't come just simply from the current representatives. It, what you need is uh, what he called a continental conference or what we would later call a constitutional convention, an independent body that would produce, um, uh, produce a constitution and that would protect the you know, he said, first and foremost, you know, the rights of liberty of conscience. And, and um, he also, you know, there was also a very practical um, argument that without issuing what he called a manifesto uh, to foreign courts, and by manifesto, he meant a document that spelled out um, the uh, injuries that the colonies had suffered, their various modes of of trying to obtain redress, uh, the answers to those modes, <laughs> um, and you know the sense that necessity had brought them to a, a point where they had to declare a separation. He called that a manifesto or a memorial. We would call that the Declaration of Independence. Um, and so, you know, um, there is a there is a sense that, you know, no no country would um, step into uh, to, um, what would otherwise be a civil war uh, on the side of the Americans without such a manifesto. Um, and no society would want to, no um, foreign court would want to trade uh, uh, necessarily um, with, with America without that, um, that level of uh, assurance of, of independence. And certainly behind the scenes, no, no country, other country was going to come in on the side of uh, the Americans without that kind of um, manifesto or, or memorial or declaration. The, you know, the long S, um, you see it there, uh, spot, I always think of the poem um, Paradise Lost, which, you know, on the title page looks like Paradise Loft. Um, uh, it, it dies a it dies a long and lingering death. Finally, um, in the early 19th century, I think it probably you don't see it um, survive uh, the 19th century, but it is it is a vestige, um, and it throws you for a while. But I think you can get um, you can get used to it. I actually don't know the the origins of the of the long s. Um, some printers are. Um, running out of S's. And so they're adding these, um, these, uh, you know, because of the type supply. And um, in other cases, there's a real um, practice uh, to it so that you might not end a word with a long S or start a word with a long S. But in, in, in the case of, um, you know, you can see stand is started with it. Um, but it looks like fourth a little bit. Spot is started with it. I, I think more often you see it um, in the middle, but that's not always the the case. And some of it is just um, local practice. Yeah, it it really does. It really takes a little while to get used to. But you would be surprised how quickly you adjust to it. It's a it's a German letter. It's supposed to replace two S's in the middle of mm. the word. But you see, we don't follow that rule anywhere on here except and, oppression. Yeah. <laughs> but they're only supposed to use one of them. So we broke that rule too. So it should only be one long S. It's a double S, um, which is kind of interesting. If you look at the bottom down here, a fugitive, mm -hmm. if you compare that F to stranger, the long S usually doesn't have as much of a bar around in the middle there. And sometimes it has a little bit more at the bottom. So you see this one has like a little bit more of a bar than this one does. And then uh, Asia does here. And Africa has just yeah. a little bit more. Um, when you it's see certainly, them in handwriting, they really look like an F, except the bottom part hook is backwards. Yeah. 
it throw it throws you know readers when they start looking at newspapers and pamphlets from this period. But I, I think your eyes begin to uh, to compensate and to adjust, yeah. and and pretty soon you know you realize it can't be enough. <laughs> We are at 7.50, so we're going to go to our next slide. Well, this is just another example, um, and we can actually move through these uh, quite quickly. Um, you know, uh, but where some say is the king of America, I will tell you, friend, he reigns above and doth make havoc of mankind like the royal brute of Britain. Again, uh, readers would have just been, I think, shocked to see um, this kind of uh, language um, within the context of a, of a reference to the king and the, and the British publisher simply won't, um, won't include it. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, I think readers, you know, when you see a slide like this, you see just how many passages um, there were uh, that were, um, that were very critical or derogatory of the king and where um, British printers were cagey about including them. Uh, this again appears in the third section of of common sense, it includes you know Lord North's name, which has been uh, filled in. But the question really arises: How would a reader navigate um, uh, all of these blank spaces? You know, if it's just N blank, you can probably guess it's North, or K blank, you can guess it's the King, uh, or T. Um, you might think it's Tyrant, but but these long passages, you would have just been completely at sea, except it's quite likely that some booksellers included, and you can show this on the next slide, um, a single sheet with no publisher's information on it and no references to common sense that tells you what are the passages to insert into the hiatuses. So separated from the book itself um, with passages taken completely out of context so that they're not liable uh, to, um, to uh, charges of seditious libel. Uh, and these might have been provided to uh, readers, though very carefully, I imagine, um, so that you didn't get you know, somebody um, uh, from the government walking in and asking for, uh, for one of these. Um, very few, I think maybe only a handful, two or three of these um, copies survive. Uh, um, you know, whereas we have, I think, two dozen of the of the copies, um, like the 1793 uh, Common Sense, for which they would have been, you know, could have been used. Uh, one of the things that I love and uh, and students always enjoy is that even in printing the declaration, you couldn't name the king. You couldn't name the, the main person who was charged with all of those he has, he has um, done this and that. And so consequently, you remove the word king and they, they just charge the, the, the history of the present blank of Great Britain is a history of unremitted uh, injuries and usurpations. And you can't say tyrant or tyranny. Um, so those, those words just appear with a T uh, dash. Um, and that was, that was just the case. Uh, right, you know, um, the Gentleman's Magazine is incredibly popular in the, in the colonies uh, and in the early United States. And so, um, its motto, because it brought together many articles from elsewhere, it reprinted things, uh, was um, e pluribus unum, or out of many one. And that was the, the motto that was then adopted for uh, the United States, right? Out of many one. But a, ma a magazine in this period is something that is made by collecting lots of different um, uh, pre previously published things. And so out of many one made sense as their motto too. As I was preparing my my lectures on um, on, on the Declaration, I I was looking through the Gilder Lehrman um, catalog and hit upon this wonderful uh, letter between um, James Bowden, who was uh, the president of the Executive Council in Massachusetts, first of the provisional government, then of the sort of state government, and he's writing in 1777. You know, almost uh, nine months after, almost a year after. Uh, independence has been declared. And he's writing to Catherine McCauley, uh, who is a radical historian, has produced um, five, I think, volumes of her, uh, eventually eight volumes of the history of England, which holds from a very radical um, standpoint. Uh, she corresponds with all, all sorts of figures in the late colonial period, including 
um, Sarah Prince Gill, who connects her with John Adams, but also Richard Henry Lee and John Dickinson and, and the Boston Town Meeting and, and so forth. And so here is James Bowden writing to Catherine Macaulay about the what he calls the chimerical quest to try to conquer um, conquer America. Uh, he says, none, I believe, but the deluded blank and ministry can even think of it. Um, so none, but even the deluded king, uh, which is clearly what um, he intended. Uh, but he, you know, either because old habits die hard, or he felt that um, if his letter is intercepted on its way to Macaulay, that Macaulay um, was herself uh, subject to, to um, some form uh, uh, of um, of action of legal action uh, just by possessing uh, uh, a libel against the the king for whatever reason but you see it it doesn't it's not just a an artifact of of sort of print uh, culture at this time it also exists in manuscript and so two two final images the first is um just making the case that when Payne's pamphlet was republished in 1791 and 1792, it was part of a, an attempt by um, publishers, two publishers in Albany, New York, who wanted to put together a collection of Payne's political writings. So Rights of Man had just come out in 17, uh, early 1791. And by July of 1791, uh, two publishers in Albany were taking out subscriptions. So they would ask people to um, to uh, agree to to, um, to purchase a copy when it when it was printed. In some cases, to put down money early. In this case, they, they didn't require that. Um, but th this had eight pages of subscribers' names and um, in the way that uh, a British uh, subscription list might include all sorts of uh, royal royalty and aristocracy at the beginning, they've included members of Congress. But um, purchasing pain in 1791 and 1792 turns out to be uh, along party lines, turns out to be something of a partisan act. So um, there are 29 representatives to the second Congress, second federal Congress listed here on this um, first page, including James Madison, who took two copies um, of, uh, of the book. Um, there were a total of 46 copies subscribed for, but only nine of those copies were reserved for uh, members of, of Congress who we would call uh, Federalists. The rest were for the anti-administration party, the party that we would call the Democratic Republicans. And that really was Payne's fate in the 1790s, um, that his readership uh, looked like a very partisan um, readership after the defense of, uh, after the attack on paint on Burke and the defense of the, of the French and the rights of man. And then the final um, slide that when I looked at all of the subscribers to that edition, there were maybe 650 subscribers overall. Um, and they include those members of Congress, they include booksellers in all uh, of the major towns. They include even um, the, the celebrity minister, Mohican minister, Samson Occam, um, who was, a, who was a, a, had published a number of, of works and had done a tour of England in the 1760s, in, in part to raise funds for um, what would become Dartmouth. But there was only one woman's name on on the on on you know among 650 men's names, uh, and it was a woman named um, Sarah Goodrich who lived in uh, in um, New York, not far from from Albany. Um, but we know from surviving uh, examples of the of that printing, um, such as this one, which was owned by a woman named Fanny Coolidge, uh, that it had a female readership, um, that Payne had a female readership. This was probably uh, one of the first sort of post-revolutionary readers of, of um, Payne's Common Sense, certainly the first published edition of Payne's Common Sense since the, the 1770s. If it's the Fanny Coolidge who I've identified, it was a, a woman who was born in um, 1778. So after independence had grown up in, in revolutionary America and would have been in her teens when this edition was published. There's no knowing when um, she put her name on this or even if that's the right Fanny Coolidge. But I think it, it gives us a sense, you know, in thinking about the political culture of the early Republic and what pain um, meant uh, for all of those um, readers and partisans of the rights of man that there were female readers um, as well. So I just wanted to maybe end with that, um, that particular slide. 
Would you mind if we took an extra five minutes to answer some questions? So sure. Allison, do you have some questions for us? Yes. So there's a question here from Nicholas and Nicholas says, I'm curious about the title of common sense. Was this a common phrase at the time and what kinds of meaning would the words common and sense uh, have had in the 18th century that is different from today? That is a great, um, great question. And, you know, Paine's original title, I think, was Plain Truth. Um, there had actually been a pamphlet by, um, by uh, I think, Josiah uh, Hannaway in 1775, published in England, called Common Sense. Um, and that common sense supported the British Parliament. <laughs> um, and uh, I, it's doubtful that Paine um, knew it, uh, but you know, the idea that um, what Paine was saying in common sense was received wisdom um, uh, was was um, not supportable. I mean, it was a controversial um, claim uh, posing as um, common sense. And really, uh, there's a wonderful intellectual history um, uh, by Sophia uh, Rosenfeld at uh, um, at Penn in the history department at Penn, a, a book called Common Sense, a Political History, but there's also an article just about Tom Paine's common sense um, and ours, uh, in which she makes the case that you know there was a um, there were several meanings to common sense in the 18th century. There was a, a emerging Scottish school of common sense uh, philosophy. There was a French um, uh, tradition that stretched back to Pierre Bayle uh, in the late 17th century, but also included um, philosophes. Uh, um, around a sort of good sense, bon sense. Um, and, you know, Paine was playing with a number of these different ideas of, of uh, common sense. Um, but uh, yeah, apparently the, the phrase was um, Benjamin Rush's. <laughs> But we find it, you know, we find it in other, in other areas. It's, uh, it's, um, it's in the the July 1775 congressional um, document called the Declaration on the Causes for Taking Up Arms. Uh, um, so it's not a it's not a un it's not an uncommon um, phrase. Maybe not as uh, common in the period as uh, as it's since become. But you know they're they're working with ideas about um, what the Declaration will call self evidence. Right. Um, and, you know, the idea that that um, that these things need to be um, understandable by ordinary people, that they shouldn't be there shouldn't be a veneer of appeals to um, recognized elite authorities. Uh, you know, so Payne might have known Locke's second treatise, but he's certainly not saying see Locke on government. He mentions James Berg's disquisitions on political disquisitions. He mentions a now very obscure um, Italian writer named Dragonetti, uh, um, who was a, I think it's fair to say, minor utilitarian um, in the 1760s and whose book was published once in 1769. I can't find many people, if, if any. Uh, who knew that book? So Payne, you know, Payne had a reservoir of knowledge um, and you know a pastiche of different uh, sources. But he, you know, commonly said things like, you know, he was going to work rationally, and you know, his training, whether it was in Newtonian science or or not, um, taught him that the more simple a thing is, um, the better. And you know, for him, the British Constitution was impossibly complex. It was absurd. It was ridiculous. It was just against, um, you know, good plain common sense. But yes, for the for for a wonderful book on the relationship between common sense and democracy, which are really growing up together in this, uh, this period, I do suggest um, Sophia Rosenfeld's book. Allison, another one? You're muted. Thank you. There are a lot of teachers uh, here in the audience this evening, and a lot of them want to know what the main takeaway, what the most important thing uh, to know or to learn about common sense is. I think it really depends on when you read it. So if you read it in 1776 um, and you were 
pro-independence. I think it would affirm your sense. And if you knew that your purchase of the of the pamphlet was going to um, contribute to the uh, to uh, buy mittens for the Continental Army, then um, you know you were making a patriotic uh, uh, purchase. If you were for reconciliation, um, it's possible that the arguments in common sense might have persuaded you. Um, it's anything but moderate, although it often poses um, as being plain spoken and and eminently um, uh, and eminently moderate. Um, you might have read it for those um, scathing attacks on the king. You know, there was no need to um, necessarily to attack the idea of monarchy in order to make uh, separation from Britain. So that level of excess. Um, was one of the things, you know, that made the pamphlet electric. Um, and it was one of the things that gave it legs. You know, it was one of the reasons why you would have a copy in from 1791 in Albany, or you would have a copy um, from 1793 in London, uh, or from 1821 in Lima. Uh, you know, I mean, th th it was, uh, it was, um, it was useful for independence movements or for anti-monarchy uh, movements or parliamentary reform movements. Um, so I, I really do think, you know, that um, readers probably didn't step into the same common sense and readers in different locales, uh, you know, readers in Boston probably had a different experience of common sense, um, knowing what they knew about the situation in Boston than readers in in Philadelphia, the original audience for common sense readers in the South um, certainly had uh, a different um, different take on uh, on common sense. And so I, I think it really, you know, it depended on what kind of reader you were when you encountered it. You know, those soldiers who were reading common sense in 1777 and 1778 in their camps, you know, were looking for um, reaffirmation that, uh, you know, as Payne said in December, you know, these are the times that try men's souls, which is a highly, you know, not just a political stand, it's a kind of theological, um, has a theological resonance to it. And it, it was a very long and hard fought war. Uh, and so, you know, being reminded, um, being made angry again, um, having those emotions restoked, um, uh, and and being told that things could work out, you know, that if the war is won, then trade will reopen, and you know it will be better for America um, to have free, free a freer trade than to have um, Britain restricting it. Uh, um, so I think you know I I think a lot of people um, took away the the idea that independence was more practical or more um, more comfortable uh, than um, it had seemed that they were willing to use the word. <laughs> um, you know, and uh, at different points, different people wonder whether a declaration of independence is even necessary. If, if you know, a war is going on, if a Congress has begun to issue different, um, different regulations to help the, the different colonies, um, set up their governments and and so forth and maybe you have de facto independence that's certainly what john adams said ver at various points uh during the spring of of 1776 but it was you know pain who made a case that a formal manifesto um was a necessary precondition for a, a kind of successful um afterlife a successful set of international relations um, Allison, make sure our lesson plan on common sense is included in the materials we send out afterwards um, for sure the thing. teachers. And is there one more quick question? I think it'll be quick. Um, people are asking about what the uh, liter literacy rate was for uh, for this point in time. Boy, um, it's hard. It's hard for me to say. Um, you know, there, there was a point, and I think it depends on where you're looking. Um, I think the, you know, and what segment of the population you're thinking about. 
you have a large enslaved population and a large enslaved black population, um, few of whom have access to literacy. Um, you have, uh, at the time, um, a large indentured population and depending on their trades, they might, um, they might have very rudimentary literacy. They might, for instance, um, be able to read print, but not manuscript, <laughs> right? I mean, we, we sort of, I, you know, um, that's a problem that persists today <laughs> among, you know, uh, um, among children of, of my children's generation who don't necessarily know how to read, um, you know, uh, letters from their grandparents or something like that, but could read a textbook. Um, I think it depends in some cases on gender. Uh, so I don't have a I don't have a hard and fast um, uh, literacy rate for the population. Certainly, when you look at a, a society like that of Massachusetts in the late 17th century, that was one of the most literate societies. But it was a case where people had reading literacy, but maybe not writing literacy. They could read the Bible because it was thought to be. Um, a kind of precondition to to either church membership or to their own salvation, um, but writing was not a, a necessary art um, for for others, and so those those skills were sometimes um, separated out. Uh, but you're getting you're getting um, a much more literate society. You're getting a society um, that, in this case, uh, you know, in the 1760s, will often have you know, a single um, issue of a newspaper a week, but now they're starting to issue extras. Um, and by, you know, the next decade, there will be maybe three times a week. And by the 1790s, you might get it five or even six times a week. Um, you know, so uh, it's an increasingly literate um, uh, society um, or where or a society in which uh, basic functioning um, for many is dependent upon the ability to read. You for that we greatly appreciate it so our next session of inside the vault is thursday august 4th at 7 p.m we're going to be joined by professor barbara perry to discuss uh, materials from fdr's third presidential campaign uh, we are very excited to welcome professor perry back onto the program uh, and as sandy mentioned earlier um, professor slaughter is leading a graduate history course on the declaration of independence so if you loved tonight's program, I know many of you, all of you loved tonight's program. It was fantastic. Uh, you will not want to miss signing up for this course as part of the Gilder Lehrman uh, Gettysburg College MA in American History. Uh, so applications will be opening soon. And Madison has shared the links to both of these in the chat. Uh, as a reminder, the program tonight was recorded. It, along with the slide presentation, all of the links we shared with you will be sent to you in an email tomorrow. Uh, if you're not getting our emails, we may be blocked by your server. So try a different email account, send us an email, let us know. That is collectionprograms at gilderlehrman.org. We wanna hear from you. Thanks, Allison. And Eric, thank you for such a fascinating program tonight. Um, I'm a little bit of a history nerd, you might have guessed <laughs> that. I just love hearing the background of how things came into being. Like, I think common sense is one of those things most people have heard about, you know, through history classes, but how it came to be is such an interesting story. Well, it was my um, great pleasure and to get a chance to, um, to talk with, with you and Allison and with the, the, the guests um, on, on the chat tonight. Uh, and I'm really excited about the, the programs to come. Yeah, and, and your course opens registration in just two days. Today's the seventh. So in two days, you can sign up for your course. It'll be fun. All right. So with that, I'm going to say thank you. Allison, do you have anything to add? Keep reading, keep studying history. It is important now more than ever. Yep. And we will see you all next month. So have a wonderful evening. Bye. Take care. Thanks.